بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الأطيبين الأطهرين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وسل على علي أمير المؤمنين وعلى السيدة وعلى فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وصلى على الحسن والحسين فاطمة الزهراء and may peace be upon Hassan and Hussein the youth of the heaven and Ali son of Hussein and Muhammad son of Ali and Jafar son of Muhammad and Musa son of Jafar and Ali son of Musa and Muhammad son of Ali and Hassan son of Ali and all of them until the Mahdi. Reciting the verses, the religious verses. Again, I invite one more time all the brothers and sisters, the prayers, I call them all to divine piety. In the second sermon, uh, usually what we deal with, well, I already mentioned everything in the first sermon. In this sermon, I uh, need to apologize to all our prayers here. I should address our Arab brothers. They are in a very sensitive juncture of time, so I will do that in Arabic. Peace be upon the Prophet. May peace be upon our Prophet Muhammad. May peace be upon all of his family. May peace be upon all of his friends. And may peace be upon all of those who walked on their path until the day of judgment. To all the sons of our Islamic Ummah, everywhere you may be, Assalamu alaikum, may peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullah. I take this opportunity. This opportunity in the Islamic calendar, of course, we are approaching the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, the first anniversary of the Islamic awakening and the awakening of our Arab brothers, men and women from Egypt to Tunisia to Libya until Bahrain and Yemen as well. And in other Muslim countries, and so I take this opportunity in the name of the Iranian people and in the name of all the Muslims in the world, I take this opportunity to extend my congratulations to all of you. One year which was full of events has passed for the first time in Tunisia and Egypt. The public opinion of the people was taken into consideration and the people rose their voice and they casted their votes in favor of the Islamic movements. And in Libya, the same thing will happen. And this Islamic approach, which rejects Zionism and which rejects dictatorships, and which calls for independence and freedom, and which calls for progress under the flag of the Quran, this will be the fate and this will be the will, the decisive will of all of the Islamic people. This wave which we are witnessing, which opened a new page or turned a new page in the history of Islamic Iran as well, 30 years ago or three decades ago, in these very same days, the 22nd of Bahman, which coincides to be the 11th of February, at that time, the first blow was dealt to America and to the NATO and to Zionism. And this revolution overthrew the biggest dictator, the biggest agent in the region. And at the same, in the same days, in the same way, and with the same demands, we saw the Middle East and the awakening which happened in the Arab world, and thank God for this. The will of God wanted these people to awaken, 
the century of Islam, the era of the people has come and this will be very important for the destiny and fate of all people. The youngsters and the intellectuals who went down in Washington and in London and Madrid and Athens, this also took inspiration from the Tahrir Square, wasn't it as such? The awakening of going back to Islam and getting back dignity and identity happened in the Islamic world, in the most sensitive parts of the Islamic world. And everywhere we hear the slogan of Allahu Akbar, God is great. The Arab people can no longer put up with the dictators. They can no longer put up with agents and spies in control. They can no longer put up with tyrants in control. They are sick of this. They are sick of suffering from this poverty, from backwardness. They are sick of the agents, of the spies. They are sick of this uh, political system, the liberal system, and the national system. And they believed that they reached a dead end. The Arab people, of course, they reject also extremism and they reject sectarian violence. They reject going backwards, going backwards in a way which is only on the outside looks like Islam. The elections of Tunisia and Egypt and the slogans and the approach of the people in Yemen and Bahrain and all other Arab countries, this approach shows very clearly that these people want to be Muslims, modern Muslims. It shows that they want to be modern Muslims. And they do not want to be extremists. They don't want to behave in, with arrogance. And with the slogan of Allahu Akbar, they want an Islamic project which brings about justice and accepts pluralism, which brings about sovereignty of the people and sovereignty of religion. They want to be liberated from the century of manipulation and oppression and colonialism corrupt and corruption and poverty and racism. This is the appropriate way. What is the uniqueness of the Arab regimes which were subject to the anger of their people. It's the religious approach and bowing down and surrendering and being spies and agents for the West, America and Britain and other similar countries and dealing with the Zionists and betraying the Palestinian cause. This is what was unique about some certain Arab regimes and dictatorship control, the control of families, the backward approach, the absence of faith, in addition to the huge wealth of the families who were in power, the ruling families, and the differentiation and the absence of justice, the absence of the law and freedom. All of this is what was unique, what was common amongst those regimes, these specific regimes in the Arab world. Even protests in Islam and in some areas was not possible. And the people were not tricked. This is the way to know the nature of the awakening of the Arab people, whether it be those who were able to achieve big victories or those who will achieve victories, God willing. All the allegations regarding the nature of these revolutions, these revolutions which began with the slogan of Allahu Akbar, these allegations neglect the reality in order to achieve certain goals which are under a cover and also to derail these revolutions. So the, we have to focus on the future of these revolutions and how solid these revolutions are or if they will derail or not. We can know things by their opposite and we can know the revolutions by the regimes which were shaken and taken away by these revolutions. The revolutionaries must continue with their march 
must continue to strive to achieve their goals and they must also attempt to make these slogans reality. The West is striving without any doubt not to, to replace these revolutions with other revolutions. And in the end, the enemies are trying to bring about the old regimes, but with new means to, to keep their control on the Arab world for tens of years, for decades to come. And they are trying to do this by trying to bring about certain divisions, by trying to change those who brought about the revolution and by bringing about reforms which are really empty reforms and trying to show that they are with democracy. The West, for decades, especially in the, the last few years, after the West was defeated consecutively in Iran and in Afghanistan and even in Iraq and Palestine and Lebanon and now in Egypt and Tunisia, they have also been defeated. And in other areas, after these defeats, after these failures, the West has resorted to violence, general violence, violence, but in a different way. This violence is to try and bring about a fabricated example to terrorize people instead of, and to try and show that these people, these Muslims are terrorists instead of being martyrs. And the West is trying to make violence and replace violence, put violence in the place of the Islamic approach, in the place of jihad. They are trying to show that those who practice jihadism, jihad, are people who are violent people. They are trying to show that people belong to certain tribes instead of belonging to the Islamic ummah and belonging to Islam in general. They are also trying to show that the economic way, the cultural way here is not the way of development. They are trying to show that we cannot be independent. They are trying to show that we cannot be educated people. This is the approach of the West. They are trying to show that we are corrupt. They are trying to put corruption in the place of freedom. They do this in the name of preserving security and order. But this all aims for certain worldly goals, to achieve worldly goals, silly goals, in the name of growth and development. But this only leads to more backwardness. The world, the divisions which we witnessed before between two different parts, the consumer capitalist system and uh, the communism, this uh, conflict between capitalists and communists has ended. And today we have a conflict between the weak in the world, those who are oppressed and who have been led by the Islamic awakening and uh, with the arrogant powers under, under the leadership of America and NATO and Zionism. Now we have two different camps, as I said. There is no third camp. In this opportunity, this short opportunity, I don't want to go deep into the past. I don't want to speak about the awakenings of the Arab peoples. We, together with the whole world, without any doubt, we look at the region with admiration and appreciation. We appreciate the people who have awakened in the Arab Peninsula, into northern Africa as well. However, I want to speak about the present and the future as well. Last year, from this podium, in Friday, on Friday prayers, I spoke to the Egyptian people, the honorable Egyptian people, when Mubarak was still in power and today we have a new era and the dictator now is being tried in court and we all are full of hope that the future of the awakening of Egypt will be a bright future. We are full of hope that the future of the Arab world will be a bright future. I ask the question first of all, who are the different sides? Who are the different sides who are present in the arena of revolutions? Of course, first of all, America and NATO and the Zionist system 
and those who support them, those who are with them in, the Arab, in some Arab regimes, they are there, they are present. Second of all, the people and the youth. And third, the parties and the political activists, the Islamic political activists and the non-Islamic political activists. They are also there in the squares. Where is the stance of each of these sides? And what are the aims of each of these sides? The first group, America and the Zionists and the NATO, they are the primary losers in Egypt and in Tunisia and other Arab countries which are witnessing an awakening. The legitimacy and the presence of the cat capitalist poll and the liberal democratic system of the West, it is now losing and America is always trying to take advantage of any situation and the countries of this camp now are in a very difficult, they are similar to the situation of the eastern camp during the 1980s, the moral corruption, collapse and the continuous and ongoing economic crises and the, the military defeats in Iraq and Afghanistan and Lebanon and in Gaza and the overthrow or the shaking of the biggest dictatorships, the biggest agents who worked for them in the Muslim world and the Arab world, especially the way they lost Egypt and the danger to the Zionist entity from the east and the west and from, ins from the inside as well, as well in an unprecedented way. And the problems surrounding the international organizations, in addition to the double standard policy when it comes to democracy and human rights, and their contradictory stances, their double standard stances towards the situation in Libya and Egypt and Bahrain and Yemen, all of this has weakened this first group, America, NATO, and Zionists. They are now within the crisis. They are witnessing a crisis of lack of trust and confidence. They are in a deep crisis when it comes to their cap cap capability of making decisions. After they were incapable of controlling the people and oppressing the people, after they failed in controlling the revolutions and after they were incapable of penetrating into the political parties to preserve just some part of the previous corrupt regimes and the way they just focused on some simple reforms and after they failed in rebuilding their spies and their agents in some countries, now they are resorting to threats and they might in the future resort to assassinations to assassinations of certain individuals and certain groups for the sake of stopping the wheels of a revolution from turning or to make them turn backwards and to put despair in the hearts of the people. They might keep the people preoccupied as well in certain internal conflicts and they might try and bring about simple issues to divide the people. They might try to light up the tribal conflicts and political party conflicts. They might try and also bring about other conflicts in order to change or derail the revolutions and have a direct or indirect influence or effect on the people of the revolution, on their thinking, on their slogans. They might try and put the people of the revolutions, they might push them into confrontations with one another and they might try and expand these divisions in order for these divisions to include different, more, more people different people and behind the scenes they also might make empty promises such as financial support and other types of support so they will try many different maneuvers and this is what I pointed out to in the International Conference of the Islamic Awakening in Tehran some of the regimes the Arab regimes who are with America, they stand 
with America, side by side with America and NATO, in order to preserve their positions of power. And with all their strength, they strive to put an end, to, to stop the wheels from turning, and they strive to push the revolutions backward, or try and derail them and take them to an unknown location. And their uh, main focus here is the dollars of oil, and their main aim as well is to defeat the people in Egypt and in Tunisia and in Yemen and in Bahrain and to preserve the Zionist entity and to guarantee the continued presence of a Zionist entity and to deal a severe blow to the resistance axis in the region. The second group, the real group, is the people. What do the people want? The statistics, the American statistics, the repeated statistics show that in Egypt and in the Islamic world, these statistics and opinion show, polls show the reality. And they say that the approach and going to the mosques and the commitment to Islam and Islamic principles like hijab and the Islamic clothing of the women, these opinion polls and statistics show that this has increased over the past five years, ever since 2003 until the year 2008. This has increased by 40, between 40 and 75 percent. This has increased amongst the people from Egypt to Jordan to Turkey and to Malaysia and other countries, other Islamic countries. And the anger towards America has increased as well by 85 percent in the Arab countries and Islamic countries and the hope for the future and hope to achieve victory has doubled especially amongst the youth and especially after they witnessed the victory of the people of Hezbollah, the youth of Hezbollah and Hamas in the two wars, the 33-day war and the 22nd-day war, respectively, of Hamas, of Hezbollah and Hamas. And after the defeat of America, without America making any achievements after its defeat from Iraq, so these hopes have increased and doubled. The people in Egypt, according to the statistics, the most loved people in Egypt are the Islamic Mujahideen against the Zionist entity. They are the most loved people. The hatred towards Zionism and the focusing on the Palestinian cause and holding on to the Islamic dignity is one of the unique issues. And 75% of the Egyptian people have casted their votes in support of the Islamic slogan. So this all shows the changes which we have witnessed in Tunisia as well. The majority raised this slogan and in Libya, although the percentage was not more, it is not less. And the people are demanding from their representatives and from their new governments, they are demanding achieving these very same aims also in the future. The people want Egypt to be a country of dignity, a country which is respected, a country which is free. They don't want Egypt to be an Egypt of Camp David. They don't want Egypt to be an Egypt which is part of the West. They don't want Egypt to be subject to the dictations of America. They don't want Egypt to be an ally of Israel. They don't want Egypt to be extreme and they don't want Egypt to be a country of the West or a secular country. They want Egypt to be a free country, a country of dignity, an Islamic country, a developed country. This is the most primary principle for the youth. The army of Egypt, they don't want the army to confront the people in Egypt. Inside Egypt and outside Egypt, there are some who want to bring about a confrontation between the army and the people in the future. And everybody must be very cautious here. The Egyptian army will not take the American influence and will not take in the Israeli influence, will not be influenced by America or Israel. And when we hear about the Islamic approach in Egypt and in Tunisia or in Libya, we know that this is the Islam of the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. This Islam, this Islam, 
which included in Medina people who were Christians and Jews as well, but they were safe in this area. It was not Islam which neglected others. It, Islam doesn't mean wars between different worshippers of God. It doesn't mean sectarian wars or religious wars amongst Muslims themselves. Islam cares for all people, Jews, Christians, everyone. And Sheikh Shaltut has said this, our people in Egypt and in Tunisia and in Libya must all realize that what they achieved is a revolution which hasn't been completed. And although they have taken very big steps, they are at the beginning of a road, a road which is full of obstacles, obstacles which were planted after the victory of the revolution which we achieved here in Iran, for example. And we still are witnessing obstacles here in Iran, but the, they failed. The obstacles have been overcome one after the other. These obstacles were hundreds of times which we witnessed were hundreds of times the difficulty which we had during the era of the Shah. So we must be very vigilant and the wheels of a revolution must turn until we approach the ending stages. We must have a program and a vision, a medium term and a long term vision. The tyranny of Egypt was the first government which betrayed the Palestinian cause, the Egyptians, the previous government, and they opened the road for the Arabs who turned backward, and even some of the Arab regimes, or one Arab regime which accepts Syria, sorry, one, only one Arab regime didn't sell the cause of Palestine. But others sold the, sold the cause of Palestine. The Egyptian regime was one of the regimes which America and Israel had trust in. And the American president chose Egypt of Hosni Mubarak to send a message, a lie to the Palestinians and to the Egyptians. However, the Egyptians announced their stance in their revolution. They announced their stance very clearly and they took away any dreams which some people might have had in their minds, false dreams. Egypt today must retrieve its role, retrieve its role as a primary defender of the Palestinian cause and it must crush with its own two feet the Camp David Treaty, which is a treaty of betrayal and it must burn this treaty. The Egypt of the revolution no longer can take in a tyrant and support Israel on the account of the Egyptian people. And the second people we want to speak to are the, or the third group we want to speak to, are the intellectuals and the political parties in Egypt and other countries which are witnessing an awakening. The intellectuals and the Islamic thinkers and scholars in North Africa from Egypt to Tunisia and even in Algeria and Morocco and especially in Egypt, these intellectuals and these scholars were very important thinkers and have played a very important part in the Islamic awakening and played a very important part in calling for unity in the Ummah and also play a very important part when it comes to the liberation of Jerusalem Al-Quds. Today you are inheriting the blood of thousands of martyrs and tens of thousands of people who have been freed from prison and who have come back once again, people who have been tortured. You are inheriting what was given to you from the Mujahideen who made all of these sacrifices decade after decade until we reach a new era like this era which we are witnessing now, the, this area where we are seeing victories. My brothers and sisters, please preserve what has been given to you by the sacrifices of the martyrs. We must not be naive at this very important period, after this period of the first victory. You take the responsibility. You take the biggest responsibility in bringing about the benefits for the people and solving the problems of the awakening. The international and regional powers who have been dealt a blow of course, they have certain devil, devilish ideas and they, plan, they are planning revenge. They are making plans against the revolution. They are trying to terrorize. 
And in the end, they are thinking of overthrowing the revolutions and they are thinking about bringing about even worse situation, a worse situation than what than there was before. May God forbid. Your decisions and your stances will have historic effects. And this stage, this period, is a very important period in the history of your countries. Don't be confident. Don't trust America and NATO because they don't think about your interests. They don't think about the interests of your people. And don't be afraid of them because they are becoming weaker and weaker very quickly. Their control on the Islamic world was only a result of our fear and our ignorance for 150 years. So don't put hope in their hearts and don't be afraid of them. Don't pin your hopes of them as well. Only depend on God. And have confidence only in your people. Have trust only in your people. They were defeated in Iraq. And they left in a humiliating humiliating way. In Afghanistan, they hadn't achieved anything. In Lebanon, they were defeated by Hezbollah. And in Gaza, they were defeated by Hamas. And today, they are trying to make something happen in Egypt and Tunisia. But they haven't achieved anything in their program, in their project. The Western statue has been defeated like the communist statue was defeated. And the wall of fear, the wall of fear for the people has been destroyed. So do not be afraid. Be cautious of their games. And also be cautious of the games of the oil dollars for the spies of the West and their allies in the Arab world. You won't be safe in the future. You won't be safe from these games. Israel will be eliminated, will cease to exist. No doubt about it. The The beginning of the derailment in any revolution is to bow down to the Zionist entity and to continue with the negotiations of surrender. And the foundations of such negotiations were laid by the previous regimes who were overthrown. The main demand of your people is to go back to Islam. And this doesn't mean... This doesn't mean to go back to the past, to to go backwards. If the revolutions preserve their nature, their real nature, and if they continue, and if they are not subject to any conspiracies, then the main issue for you is how to bring about a law and order and how to bring about a constitution and manage the state affairs after the revolution. This is also the responsibility of bringing about an Islamic civilization in this modern time in history. In this great jihad, your main duty will be to rebuild what your country suffered from during the rule of oppression. During that time, of course, there was poverty and the rulers were very far away from religion. So you must rebuild this in the shortest period possible. And the way your society is built with an Islamic orientation and by the rule of the people, by taking into consideration education and by confronting threats, outside threats, one by one after the other and how to bring about freedom and how to preserve social rights without liberalism, the liberal system, and without any Marxism, and to bring about discipline without fascism, the Western fascism. Preserve your commitment to the Islamic Sharia, the progressive Islamic Sharia, without being frozen, without going backward, and realize no 
how to take advantage of the opportunity without being cornered and know how to not be part of an outside agenda, know how to manage the education without being secularists. You must reread the system. The West is presenting you with two alternatives, the secular Islam or the takfiri Islam, which means hatred towards all other, other sects. But we must confront this. We must have a moderate Islam in the revolutions, in the countries of our revolutions. Bring meaning once again to the terms which are used. If democracy means popularity and free elections within the context of revolutions, let, let us all be democrats, democratic. If democracy means to be part of a liberal system and being also part of a Western system, let no one be democratic then. And if it means we go back to the Quran and to hold on to the principles and to confront all of the all of the, everything which is anti-Islam and to reject the Western system, let us all be Salafists then. And if we if extremism and violence between religions and religious sects if we have violence between different Islamic sects, if this is Salafism, this is not within the spirit of forgiveness, which is one of the most important parts of the Islamic system with Islamic civilization. And we can so we cannot be secularists, nor can we be people who are violent and call for confrontation amongst Muslims. Beware of the Islam which Washington and Paris and London are demanding, whether it be the secular Islam or the stubborn, extreme, violent Islam. Don't be confident in the Islam which believes in the existence of the Zionist entity, but at the same time confronts other Islamic sects and extends the hand of friendship towards America and NATO however at the same time works inside to light up conflicts or tribal conflicts and sectarian conflicts under this Islam. Don't believe in this. Don't be part of such a project. Be pessimistic towards the American and British Islam because such an Islam will push you to be part of the Western capitalist system and be part of the consumer society and be morally corrupt and ethically corrupt. During the previous decades, the intellectuals and the rulers were proud of their strength, of being part of the West, France, Britain, the USSR previously and America and they used to run away from the Islam, from the Islamic example. Today the situation is the opposite. Beware that the West will be in the process of taking revenge, economic, military, political and media revenge. And if the people of Egypt and Tunisia and Libya and other people, if they continue with their march on the road of God and Allah, we can overcome these games and these obstacles. The, my last words are regarding the readiness of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the readiness of the Iranian people to serve you, serve you and to be with you, to deal with you, to help each other. The Islamic Republic of Iran is the Islamic, the biggest success in the examples of revolutions, the biggest success in modern history when it comes to regaining the confidence, self-confidence of the people and bringing about confidence once again of the intellectuals in their people. It's a successful example also when it comes to confronting the tyrants 
and to take it away the taking away the and crushing the arrogance of the communists it's a great example of development as well while at the same time preserving the sovereignty of the people and defending the main principles my dear brothers and sisters for years they have been lying to you regarding your Iranian brothers and the truth regarding Iran, the Islamic Iran, is this which I am showing you today. Our strength has achieved victories, victories over the past three decades. And we also had weak points. However, what Islamic awakening in the whole world after the Western and Eastern control on the Muslims in the previous century what and there has been no Islamic revolution which have achieved such progress and have overcome all of these obstacles and hurdles I will be speaking to you a lot in the future God willing you will have to overcome the capitalist system and the Zionists and Iran is accused of terrorism but at the same time, it's only accused of terrorism because it rejected to leave the Arabs in Palestine and in Lebanon. It's accused of terrorism because it refused to abandon the Arabs in Palestine and Lebanon and Iraq. But the real situation is that the victims of terrorism in the world, this terrorism which is still continuing until today against us, if the Islamic Revolution and if the Islamic Republic, if it left our oppressed people in Afghanistan and in Bosnia and Lebanon and Iraq and in Palestine, if it had left them alone and abandoned them like the other governments who just show on the outside they are Muslim, if we were just like the most of the Arab regimes who betrayed the Palestinian cause and if we were silent and if we turned a blind eye they wouldn't have accused us of being terrorists, of being part of terrorism. We are thinking of liberating Jerusalem al-Quds. We are thinking of liberating Palestinian territories. This is the big crime which the Iranian people have committed. This is a big crime which the Islamic Republic has committed. They speak about Iranian expansionism. They speak about Shia expansionism. But our Islamic revolution was not only a Shia revolution or only an Iranian revolution. We didn't consider it as such. For the past three decades, what we paid the price for and the reason why we were subject to threats is because we have an Islamic orientation, because we belong to the Islamic Ummah and because we raise a slogan of unity, unity amongst Muslims and freedom and pride for all the Muslims from Eastern Asia to the middle of Africa, Central Africa to Europe. Iran, the Iran of Muslims, Islamic Iran has made big, has taken big steps unique steps in education and social rights and justice, social justice and growth and health and the rights of the women and rights of minorities, religious minorities. It's taken steps in many different arenas, but we also know our weak points. But with God's help and with God's strength, we are working to address these weak points, God willing. The resistance in the region has changed. The equation of resistance has changed with the help of the Islamic Republic. And with these stones which are in the hands of the Palestinians, now they have rockets in Gaza. In, in Gaza, the resistance factions, the Islamic resistance factions are fighting the occupants. Iran is not targeting 
to expand Iranianism or Shiism amongst the Muslims. Iran is walking the path of defending the Quran, defending the Sunnah and awakening the Islamic Ummah. The Islamic Revolution believes that helping the Mujahideen the Sunnah in Hamas and the Islamic Jihad and the Shia Mujahideen in Hezbollah and in the Amal movement, we believe that all this is a religious duty, a task from God, a duty from God. There is no differentiation here and the government of Iran announces very clearly that it believes in the awakening of the people. It doesn't believe in terrorism. It believes in the Muslims. It doesn't believe in sectarian conflict. It believes in the Islamic strength. It doesn't believe in nationalism nationalism of one group against the other. It believes in the Islamic Jihad, not in violence of one group against another. We are committed towards this God willing. I pray to God and I ask that God give all the people, all the Muslim people, give, grant them happiness. I ask to God that we achieve success in understanding our big responsibilities and that we can rise and fulfill these responsibilities. And we believe, we know that God will make us achieve victory. All you who believe in God, believe and help the oppressed and be against the oppressors. I say this and I pray to God in the name of God, the merciful if God's victory comes and if you see people coming to the religion of God, then praise God.